in the center of modern Cairo, just yards from the River Nile, I've come to the Egyptian Museum for a rather special rendezvous. This afternoon, I'm coming face to face with the great grandmother of Tutankhamun. Oh my goodness, my heart is actually beating faster. <laughs> Why is she special inside? This is right, isn't it? It's yes. supposed to be one of the best preserved it is, mummies. Absolutely. She is one of the best preserved mummies that we have. This is Tuya. She was discovered two decades before her great grandson. When we look at her face, do you think that could give us any genetic clues as to what to come in? I think that would be a quite possible, especially because they've got the same sort of teeth sticking out of it. What's really extraordinary is that she's not born royal. There's a lot of social mobility. I mean, she starts off quite common, just has a priestess, and then she's in this splendid tomb with all of this gold and stuff. Amazing. Can you smell that? It smells like resins and incense. It does. So, look down here. That's actually um, the resins that are part of the mummification and burial ritual. And they were poured over, and some of them are still you can see it must have been in a funny position yes. because of the way it's dribbled. It's wow. Weird. Can I just have a moment <laughs> to get this millennia old smell? That is amazing. This is closer than anyone normally gets to two year. I think all of our conservators are ready. It's time to see how the lady herself is faring. OK. All right. Oh my God, look at her. It's magnificent. She's so tiny and so perfect. And look at her hair. She's got this beautiful, thick head of curly, kind of strawberry blonde. Is that the original colour? Well, we don't, we're not 100% sure, but when you're using natron, which you yes. use for mummification, yeah. it's a bleach. So it's like putting salt on your hair when you go to the beach. And look at her, she's got double pierced earrings. She has. She does have that Tutankhamun overbite. She's even more beautiful than in her pictures. By two years' time, mummification had been practiced for at least 1,200 years. The sophisticated process of preparing and preserving the body would have taken over two months to complete. We know that she's a really fine example of mummification, but how can you tell her? I mean, what, what here tells you that this is a really, really, really good job? Well, I mean, it's a totally beautifully well-preserved, recognizable face. Eyebrows and her cheekbones, and her, sometimes the nose, nose. goes a bit. Yeah, weird, but it's just she's got a little bit of stuff in. She looks absolutely gorgeous. The ears are so well preserved; it's not broken. She's got her hair. The kind of wrapping, the individual wrapping of her tootsies is so perfect. Um, the fact that she's wearing sandals, and really, every care was taken with her. And from the smell, you can also tell that it was really good quality resins. OK, OK, look, look, this is really cool. OK, OK, <laughs> see, see, look at her eyes. Yeah. So what they did was they lifted the lids up and then they put in pieces of cloth, which they put a bit of resin onto and made them look like eyes so that she can see things in her afterlife. Just look at that face, what she's seen, what she's lived through, the world that she's experienced. My God, if she could talk, what she could tell us. Salima will now check that the humidity of the museum hasn't been affecting Tuya. But the signs are that well into her fourth millennium, she's doing very well indeed. Just to be that close to her face, it really makes you realise this was a woman like me, a woman who'd had children, who'd lived through a life and was now going really happily through death to another world. And I think, I think we've got to remember that, that we think that mummies are something kind of grisly and gruesome and scary. But for these people, this is the beginning of the best after party. And uh, whatever happened to her, I hope that Tuya has been enjoying herself.
it's difficult to imagine an ancient site more iconic than the pyramids of Giza. Just look at these incredible things. However many times I see them, I'm never not blown away by them. They just pound with human ambition. The west bank of the Nile boasts over a hundred pyramids, but none are as famous as these. They've been astounding onlookers for four and a half thousand years. And recent discoveries mean we're finally able to appreciate them properly. We're so used to thinking these as desert monuments in a desert landscape, but when they were originally built, it would have been completely different around here. So the Nile now is about five miles away, but at the time it came right up close to the pyramids and when it flooded, they'd have been reflected in its glittering surface. It's one of these structures in particular I've come to see. The Great Pyramid, the eternal resting place of the Pharaoh Khufu. Scaling almost 500 feet, its completion set new levels for human achievement. It was the world's tallest structure for nearly 4,000 years. This is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and it is the only one that is still standing intact. I'm obviously a huge fan of the ancient world and ancient civilizations, and there are many amazing things across the globe, but this it is truly wonderful, isn't it? There are 2.3 million blocks of stone here, and each one has been perfectly sculpted so it fits right next to its neighbour. It's incredible. The Great Pyramid took two decades to complete. With its original polished white limestone casing, it would have gleamed out in the Egyptian sun. Uh, exactly who built it and how has been the subject of wild speculation for centuries. It's been said that this was built by aliens from outer space, but thank goodness uh, some new historical evidence has appeared that tells us without a doubt that this pyramid was made by human hand. Uh, and it's this remarkable thing. This is a copy of an ancient papyrus. Found just six years ago in a cave near the Red Sea, it's the four and a half thousand year old journal of a man called Mera. Now, Mera was no less than a project manager for the Great Pyramid. There is remarkable detail in here. He's written down how they made this beautiful thing. And here, there's a little line that tells us that the limestone blocks that covered the pyramid, that made it that amazing gleaming white, were brought from 15 miles along the Nile. Mera says it takes one day's sail for this special stone to reach the site, confirming the Nile's crucial role in the pyramid's construction. Building the world's first skyscraper was a transformational moment in human history. The city of workers that settled here collaborated in a game-changing way. And with Mark's help, I'm getting a privileged look behind the scenes to get a glimpse of their remarkable world. So, welcome to our field lab. Wow, Fed. thank you so much for letting me in here. For the past 30 years, thousands of artifacts found at Giza have been brought here to be assessed and studied in the archaeologists' storeroom. You can see it's much bigger than you would think from outside. One of the things we find all over the site are what we call dolerite hammerstones. Mm -hmm. Here. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I knew it was going to be heavy. I didn't know it was going to be that heavy. That's actually straining my arm. Yeah. So that's like a cannonball. That's well, when really they started heavy. using it, it, was, it is like a cannonball. But when they started, it was probably pear-shaped. Yeah. And they just use it to smash stone surfaces away. And then they'll turn it and keep turning it. So in the end, they get kind of a ball shape. In Mark's latest excavation, he's found remarkable evidence of how the people constructing the pyramid lived and what they ate. 
we found this enormous dump, and it was so much animal bone, sheep and goat and cattle. Yeah. And there was something very curious about it. Whenever we separate out the good meat-bearing bones, we find that the ends are broken off. Two of our Egyptian field school students said, oh, so that's easy. It's shorbit kawara, which is Arabic for like gelatin soup, knuckle bone soup. And the evidence is that somebody, elites, people of higher status, were eating the meat off the long, good meat-bearing parts of the bone. Mm -hmm. But people of lower status are eating very high-fat, high-protein, knuckle bone soup. Marx found the casseroles this soup was served in. It's so beautiful, that. And even their bespoke stands. It's almost like a Tupperware set. So actually, it seems like they're getting a pretty good diet. Indeed. That casserole is interesting because that's just like a family sized casserole. But, but yep. are they mass producing food as well? They were taking your standard average kitchen bread mold mm -hmm. and bread loaf. And then, if I may, over here. Mm -hmm. They were increasing it. They were reaching for an economy of scale oh. by making these gigantic yeah. bread molds. Yeah. yeah. Take a feel. Just uh... Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, that, that is quite a responsibility. So, you can have it back. Thank but, you. But the big picture here is that they didn't have bread factories. They were creating the world's first bread factories. It's all a long way from the stereotype of sweating slaves toiling away under the pharaoh's whip. Even the tiniest finds are captivating. These are tubular beads. We find these beads everywhere. Look, look, look at the colour. It's such a tiny little thing. But I mean, who's wearing these? And we're finding them in the workers' barracks, right where we find all the big heavy dolerite pounders. So what, are you pounding stone as you're wearing your beaded <laughs> neck? We don't know. Finds like these speak volumes helping to jigsaw puzzle together a picture of life for those at the bottom of the pile. This morning, my authentic Bronze Age desert transport is called whiskey and soda. I'm not sure they had stirrups then, but you know, I think in the name of security I can do this. One, One okay, two, two, three. Okay. One, two, three. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Right. I'm excited. Shall we go? Yalla, yalla. Bye, Ramses. Bye. See you in 2,000 years. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Come on, darling. Up you go. Oh, she's great, isn't she? <laughs> she's, she's a natural historian. She wants to get there. This empty desert landscape would once have played host to massive funeral processions as dead pharaohs were carried to their show-off, newly designed tombs, pyramids. This is the very first pyramid ever built. It's the step pyramid. So you've got a tomb laid out at the bottom and then the pharaoh decided to build another one on top and another one and another one that becomes like some kind of massive wedding cake. You can see it's a kind of experiment, really. It's when they're going, I'm the most powerful man on earth. Look at me, I can reach up to the sky, I can reach up to the gods. What I've come to see, though, is another first for Egypt, on the other side of the Step Pyramid. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you, darling. Okay. You've been beautiful. These are the sorry ruins of the pyramid built for the pharaoh Unas. People are being allowed back in here for the first time in two decades because it wasn't safe and there was restoration work done. When it was built, 4,350 years ago, this was the smallest pyramid of its era. But it was a game changer. This is an extra special treat for me because this is the first time since I've been coming to Egypt that I've been allowed in. Hi, buddy. Very good. You're from where? No, London. London, welcome. Nice to see you, thank welcome. you. So you've got the key to go in? Yes. Amazing, thank you. The unique treasure of Unas's pyramid is found underneath it. Amazing, thank you, Shukran. Black. <laughs> this 30-metre tunnel 
is leading me right under the center of the pyramid. Three granite slabs once blocked this passage, separating the outside world from the burial chambers of Unas. Oh my goodness. This is so beautiful. I've seen pictures of this, but I've never been in here. Floor to ceiling, you've got the walls covered in hieroglyphs. Look at the, the state of them, they're so beautifully preserved. This was the first pyramid ever to be decorated in carved hieroglyphic writing. Ritual spells for the dead. Unas was, uh, I'd say, a man with quite an ego. And we can tell this here because this is his name. So here, this is the name of Unas. It's in what's called a cartouche, which is French for a bullet. It's a kind of bullet-shaped thing. And once you start to look, <laughs> you can see the name of Unas absolutely everywhere. So it's Unas, 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 Unas. It just, just goes on. Uh, and I don't know if you can see here, there's another symbol that keeps on appearing. It's these waves of water. So there are two here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here. The importance of water and rivers couldn't be clearer. One spell even claims, Unas is he who has caused the land to be underwater. Not only did Unas tell us that he was the most powerful king, but that he had divine powers. And what he's saying here is that it's him who caused the Nile itself to flood. These hieroglyphs don't always make for pleasant reading. They show that the ancient Egyptians often blended brilliance with brutality. He says that he holds the hearts of his enemies in his fingers, that he burns their houses to the ground. But there's something else, and actually, if you read it, it's really shocking. Unas takes the wives of husbands whenever he wants, whenever his heart desires. Uh, this is not a man that I would have liked to have met in the flesh. And it seems as though he's no longer here. We, we don't have his body. But there's something that's recently been discovered that, if you look on the wall, if you can see that, there, indented in, is the ghost of Unas. So he's still here with us. Unas has left a mighty legacy. And along the Nile, there are other treasures that are still as vibrant today as they have been for thousands of years.